Thank you. Um, so, uh, as Doug mentioned, I'm uh, Richard Graves. I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Building Research uh, at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about um, our Sustainable Buildings uh, 2030 program in Minnesota. One of the things we do uh, at the center is um, we run and manage the green building program uh, for the state that's directly connected to our uh, climate change uh, action strategies and as they're evolving over time. And one thing I'll add to um, some of the numbers that Doug was talking about, if you factor in the, the building related portion of the transportation sector, it actually gets up to about 80% of, uh, of our energy usage somehow relates to buildings uh, in there, in the actual energy usage and industrial processes and buildings and uh, location based energy. Uh, and we've been, and that's a whole nother talk, but we've been benchmarking that in different communities in Minnesota uh, as well. But to begin with, um, the SB 2030 program uh, began uh, in 1995 as the Hennepin County uh, Sustainable Building Guidelines. Um, and then evolved into what became in 2001 through legislation what's called the B3 program, or Buildings, Benchmarks, and, and Beyond, which is, the, which is the Green Building Program. Um, and that became legislated in and required for all, all buildings that receive um, state funding, state bond funds, um, in some way has to meet these, have, has to meet these requirements. And you know, initially in the initial standards, and they cover sites and water. That you know, it's a full range green building program. In fact, some of the early Minnesota design guidelines were source materials as lead was being created of what does a green building program uh, need to include. And uh, you know, at that time, B3 had a requirement of of 30 percent better than a standard code building. So it was relative to a code building uh, was the goal. In 2007, uh, the state really kicked into high gear in our um, climate solution and climate strategies. And as part of that uh, discussion, um, it really uh, became clear that we had to be much more aggressive um, in the building sector than just relative to, at the time, was a pretty 30% better than a pretty bad energy code. Uh, ASHRAE, the 1989 version, was the code at the time. And we had to find a way to push much more aggressively. The groups um, that advised uh, what possible solutions what we, that we could do eventually sort of honed in on um, the Architecture 30, 2030 program, which was just uh, Ed Mazaria and his group were just starting to talk about the concept of how do we get all buildings to carbon neutral uh, by 2030, and instead of having a a relative goal of 30% better than standard, focus on an end goal of getting to carbon neutral by 2030. So, so that's, what was, that's what was proposed. Um, what we had to work out with the exact program is it's easy sort of conceptually to think about uh, instituting a program like 2030 and getting to carbon neutral. There were some nuances that we had to, to work out. So, uh, for instance, Architecture 2030, the baseline is a standard building in 2003 by the CBEX um, standard. And it's all buildings around uh, the country. And so what we had to do, the other thing that Architecture 2030 allows is that buildings can purchase RECs to make up the difference um, to hit their targets. And, but when this was applied to, to Minnesota, we had to look at what is a standard building what's standard practice in Minnesota, so what's our baseline? And so in this case, we had to start with looking at what was code at the time the legislation was put into place, which was a uh, ASHRAE 1989 building. So it's a worse building than what Architecture 2030 starts with. Um, but also, we had to look at how the program fit in the entire constellation of all the climate strategies. We had other targets on remaking the grid and adding more renewables in the grid and things like that. So SB 2030 decided to not even um, include RECs. That's going to be part of other aspects um, uh, of our climate strategies. So we'll just hone in on the buildings alone and what you can do uh, 
with maximizing efficiency and eventually over time adding more renewables building site by building site. So the result is, and this graphic kind of shows on the, the left hand side bars are sort of where we were starting with FSB 2030 and the right hand side is architecture 2030. We're all getting to the same place which is carbon neutral buildings um, by 2030 but we're getting there in a little different way. Some other program elements that, that became important is um, there we developed and worked with the utilities to cre create a utility incentive program, an energy, energy design assistance program for projects where they could get energy modeling and some other things uh, as they worked on these projects. Develop a case study database of, of the projects, what are we learning, what's working well, um, and then also uh, create an energy efficient operations program. So it's required, again, it's required for all buildings that receive state funding, all new buildings, all uh, substantially renovated buildings, anything over 10,000 square feet. And even if, it's, uh, if they're just switching out the mechanical system, it's still required and we have sets of prescriptive things that, that we have to do. Um, and it started with schematic design in, in 2009, so all those projects had to meet the first level. It also, and it's not on the slide here, there's also a requirement that you must meet these standards as long as you can pay for increased costs within 15 years, which is a pretty nice uh, long period of time uh, to define what is cost effectiveness. So the requirements started as all buildings uh, in, uh, as of August 1st, 2009, had to be 60% better than the, the baseline. And then as of uh, January 1st this year, we ramped it up to 70% better than 80, than 90, than carbon neutral by 2030. The types of buildings it applies to are, it runs the gamut. It actually, um, we were talking about it the other day, we pretty much have every type of building uh, that you could have in the commercial and even residential. We've done single family houses, we've done multifamily housing, office buildings, to all the way to very in energy intensive um, research labs uh, in the program. So here's some examples of projects. They all, you can find, uh, we have and keep up to date a case studies database of what energy target are they hitting, um, at what strategies they're using, what works and what, and what doesn't work. Projects like little National Guard, Minnesota National Guard armory renovations uh, and retrofitting it. And the other thing that's important to understand is the projects have hit design targets, but it doesn't stop at the end of the design. We keep tracking energy performance during actual operations because they're not compliant until two years of operational data to show that the design is actually operating um, as we set in the target. Other projects, this is a, a residence hall at the University of Minnesota Morris um, that's a LEED Gold project and uh, uh, SB 2030 project. So we have some projects that are kind of dual certified in different programs. And this is an example of the kind of scorecard that you get in B3 and again, tracking design targets for energy, water, waste reduction, et cetera, et cetera. And then we keep tracking them in actual performance over time. So it's important to also see that the program involves the kind of full range and all the phases of these projects from pre-design before they've even hired uh, design firms, working with the agencies to get them to set targets and plans uh, in place and then working with the design teams through design uh, to hit their targets and review that they're hitting their targets. Then into operations, we have our operations programs help make that transition and then tracking actual performance. Um, and then even after two years, the projects go into our, this is the one of the other Bs, the benchmarking program, where we benchmarked uh, buildings all around the state. So the new buildings go into this program, and we keep tracking their actual operation data uh, out into the future. That database has over 7,000 buildings um, in Minnesota, and we're adding to it uh, all the time. The other thing that's interesting is we have cities like St. Paul that adopted some of these standards as their local green building program. Uh, it's not, and they can't make a code more aggressive than the state, but what they can do is give out incentives and give their money for projects and require B3 
uh, or SB 2030 for those projects. So St. Paul is an example of a city using it as a tool um, to give out their incentives and track performance for projects like a minor league baseball park to a hardware store renovation to a mixed use multifamily uh, project. And for forward thinking projects like there, there was an old Ford plant in St. Paul that's about to be redeveloped and the mayor has set a goal that the redevelopment of that site be a carbon neutral development. So within that work, um, we started to work with, they had hired consultants from Denmark to review and create a strategy with district energy and energy efficiency for buildings for that site to be carbon neutral. The interesting thing is that the Danish consultants reviewed SB 2030 against Danish code and the German codes and came back and said, just use the SB 2030 program. It will get you to the same place we're going in uh, Germany and Denmark, but actually in a more sane way than we're putting our code. They, they're mandating very aggressive EUIs for every building type, and there's no tuning by building type. It's hit this target, you know, good luck with it. And what they liked about our program is we tune it to the specific building. Um, so some are more aggressive and some are less aggressive based upon building type. So, so that's what they uh, recommended and that's what the city's doing is re recommending SB 2030, 80 and 90 percent buildings to get efficient enough buildings to then make them the whole site carbon neutral in the future. And then some other work that we're doing, and I won't, in the sake of time, I won't get too far into that, but the other work that we are are doing right now is we're, we're jumping forward to the 80% better buildings and beyond and starting to prototype those because what we're finding is it's fairly easy with current technology to do the 60 and 70% buildings, but 80 and beyond and figuring out the sweet spot of where uh, you can do energy efficiency cost effectively and then when do you need to start adding renewables to hit these targets is something we need to research in the next five years when we ramp up again uh, to the next set of targets. So we're starting to do prototypes like this office prototype for the Ford site and looking at how far, how low can you get some of these EUIs uh, and then how much renewables can you add uh, on site. So, uh, so the results of the program and these numbers are uh, averages per square foot of all of the different buildings in the program. Um, but we are hitting our um, design targets and uh, carbon reduction targets over time. These are the, we're also, the other interesting thing of the cohort of projects that went through trying to hit a 60% better target, many of them are already hitting the 70% the or better uh, target, which gives us, which gives us hope that um, when we ranked up the, the standard in January that it's not putting too much of a burden at the 70% level to keep hitting these targets and make carbon reductions. So over, uh, over 200, so 286 projects have gone through the B3 program, over 70 have done SB 2030. Um, they're saving you know, millions of KBTUs per year, millions of dollars per year, so uh, it's not just about climate action, it's about good government and cost-effective operations. We'll spend less money on, on uh, energy and more money on employees and, and, and other folks in these buildings. Uh, and then we continue to expand the B3 benchmark. Um, so in, just in conclusion, to get more information, the, our website's up on the top left, www.b3mn. Uh, dot org. And then the last thing I'll, th that I'll say in conclusion is we're, Minnesota is going back into our next round of climate action strategies and, uh, and assessing uh, over the last um, uh, six years what's worked well and what's been cost effective. And the interesting initial results is the SB 2030 program uh, is one of the most cost effective strategies in dollars and the cost per ton of carbon saved. Uh, versus other strategies we're pursuing. So now the conversation's shifting in, how do we start to think about uh, SB 2030 potentially being code for all buildings uh, in the future and start to, to plan for that uh, in the program. So thank you.